Hello, everyone. We're glad to have Vivek Chiber with us. Dr. Vivek Chiber is a professor of sociology at New York University. He's the author of numerous books, including Postcolonial Theory and the Spectre of Capital, a prize winning book called Locked in Place State Building and the Late Industrialization in India, and also a more recent book, The Class Matrix Social Theory After the Culture of Terror, which was published by Harvard University Press. He also has an upcoming book called Confronting Capitalism, How the World Works and How to Change It. He's also so, uh, contributed to numerous journals and magazines, such as the Socialist Register, American Journal of Sociology, Boston Review, and New Left Review. Vivek, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Um, Vivek, you wrote a book in 2013, if I'm not mistaken, The Spectre of Capital. And uh, that's the book which was uh, which became um, very critically acclaimed, and it was highly critical of postcolonial theory in general. Uh, in the book, in this into the, uh, the first chapter of the book, you do talk about the rise of subaltern studies. So just to put our conversation in context, it would be great if you could give us some context about the rise of subaltern studies, and then we'll talk about some of the um, critiques you, you levy against uh, post-colonial theory. Well, subaltern studies was a uh, annual collection of essays coming um, out of India initially, and it was spearheaded mostly by Indian historians and anthropologists. Uh, it included a couple of non-Indians, uh, um, British scholars, but it was mostly an Indian endeavor. It took its inspiration from a certain reading of Gramsci. And the term subaltern, of course, comes out of Gramsci's prison notebooks. And what it betokened was a uh, commitment to studying the history of the lower orders, history of peasants, history of the working classes in India. Uh, this was now, remember, it comes out in starting in 1980, and it was following on the heels of a similar uh, trend in the historiography of the West that came out of the Marxists in England and the United States, and this was called History from Below. So just like the British and the American historians had started a history from below around the late 60s to early 70s, Indian historians came to this a little bit later. Uh, with a similar prospect and a similar commitment. And it was quite a watershed in the history of India. It's not like uh, the historians uh, of South Asia had ignored the lower orders. There was already a quite lively labor history and of course, peasant history coming out of India. But this was uh, a much more, uh, I would say, um, widespread and in academia, much more uh, widely recognized trend that started. Initially, it was heavily inspired by Marxism, a kind of culturally inflected Marxism. But by the fourth or fifth year, by volume four, certainly and then thereafter, it became much more heavily influenced by the emerging trend of post-structuralist and later post-colonial theory. Guy Three Spivak played a big role in this, and Edward Said famously packaged subaltern studies for distribution in the United States in a uh, edited volume, kind of an edited volume of the edited volumes, um, in introducing it to the Western audience and giving it his um, blessing. And at Said by the uh, late 90s was of course one of the most well-known intellectuals in the United States. So it gave it a, an incredible uh, uh, cachet in the United States. Uh, by this time, it had become much more wholeheartedly post-colonialist uh, endeavor uh, in fact, uh, quite critical of the Marxism out of which it came. And in my view, that's the reason it became so popular because by the 1990s, radical historiography in the United States was overwhelmingly radical, but anti-Marxist. And um, because also it was coming out of the global South, it had a exotic mystique to it. And uh, it gave it even greater credibility in the eyes of the rapidly conservatizing aging new left. Uh, you made a very good point about uh, India having this rich history of labor history before subaltern studies. And uh, I'll, I'll, that's something we'll talk about later because I was reading the new biography of Edward Said that was written by his student, uh, Timothy Brennan. And in the section of that book, he's also critical of uh, uh, the, these new waves of post-colonial scholars. I mean, he mentions that uh, when they entered academia, it was as if nobody else before them had ever resisted uh, col uh, colonization. So they had this newly found power. And for them, uh, post-colonial post post theory was mainly 
let's say it was generally a loathing or he, did, he doesn't use the word loathing anyway a dislike towards modernity in general but that's one something we'll talk about later thank you and in the book you you actually make a very good point about the distinction between uh, well, uh, universalism and universalization of capital and globalization of capital uh, can you expand on that point please yeah, it's a distinction. I don't make it so much as I describe the way in which one of the subaltern uh, scholars makes it, that's Debeish Chakrabarti. That distinction seems to be an odd one, because when we say that capital is being globalized, what we mean by that is that the properties, the economic structure that we associate with capitalism is spreading across the world. Now, universalization can be seen as a synonym for globalization. So if it's being globalized, it means it's spreading everywhere. That means it's becoming universalized. So it seems odd to draw a conceptual distinction between these two phenomena when they seem to be describing the same thing. Chakrabarti says they're not the same thing, and this is crucial. The reason he says that it's not the same thing is that even though capitalism of a kind is spreading across the world, and hence globalizing, it's distinguishing characteristics are not being universalized. So something is spreading across the world, but it doesn't look like, and it doesn't behave like classical capitalism. That's what he means by it. So it's being globalized therefore, but its properties are not being globalized. And he uses the word universalization to capture that. So what I say that then is, okay, well, that's an argument. So on what grounds can you say that the capitalism in India or in South Africa, or in Chile, is not genuinely a capitalism, so that it's globalized but not universalized. His answer to that is, well, the capitalism coming out of the West that goes into the global South doesn't um, initiate the same transformations that it did in the global North, in the advanced countries. So, okay, what does it then fail in its transforming capacities? What, what does it fail to transform? His answer is, well, it doesn't absorb all the different, the myriad social relations of these societies under its own logic, so that there's many social relations that retain their distinctive local logic. And therefore, when it spreads into Peru, into Chile, into India, it's a very limited spread. It leaves a whole array of social practices as they were. The implication being that in the West, it subsumed all the different social relations under its logic. This is what it's failing to do in the South. Okay, that's the distinction. Now, what I do is I criticize this argument in that it gives capital a power that it never had anywhere. And so if the idea is that if this was a real capitalism, it would transform all the social relations in civil society so that they are reflecting the logic of capital, well, then even the West fails on those grounds. On those grounds, it's never universalized anywhere. So we have a choice. Either we say capitalism has never universalized, or we say that this definition of universalization is wrong. That it, to, to count as universalization, you don't have to transform and subsume every single social relation under the logic of capital. It is, it's a more limited transformation. So which of the two is it? Now, for Chakrabarti and the subalternists, they have a problem. The whole premise of their project is that in the West, you did have a capitalism that is worthy of its name. So they are not free, therefore, to say that it's never universalized anywhere. The premise of their project is that it was universalized in the West. Well, that means they have to then use the same criteria by which they announced a successful universalization in the West to judge the quality of the universalization in the South. What are those criteria? The criteria cannot be that every single social relation was transformed because we know that didn't happen in the West. So the only criterion that really, uh, that really has a chance is to say it's a limited transformation. But if once you say that in the West you had a limited transformation, then you have to ask, A, of what? A limited transformation of what? Well, it was a transformation of the economy. The economy was actually transformed in the West, even though many other social relations were left to themselves. Well, if that's the grounds that you're using for the West, you now also have to use it for the global South. And if you look now with that same framework at Chile or India or Peru or South Africa, it's pretty clear that on those grounds, capital did universalize because the economy in those countries is capitalist. So the whole theory just falls apart and we're back to where we started 
in Marxism, which is to say, as capital spreads along, uh, around the globe, what it seeks to transform is the economy. It will extend beyond the economy insofar as other social relations block or preclude the successful reproduction of capital. But in the event that they don't, it'll be indifferent to them and they're gonna go their own merry way. That's what Marxists have always said. And that's where we're back now after this 20 year hiatus of gobbledygook. The basic, uh, the, the basic premise is generally flawed. And uh, Entirely, not only mean. flawed, it's catastrophically misguided. Mm -hmm. And uh, in post-colonial theory and also in that book, I guess the part of the argument is also that um, post-colonial theory is, is adept at addressing particularities of the culture. Whereas you argue, you rightly argue that uh, Marxism um, had a more, let's say, umbrella term of bringing all these differences together. I mean, Marxism brought all these laborers or, or working class people together without really negating their particularities or their differences. And that's where you, you, you argue for a return to that classic idea of socialism. Yeah, I would not say, though, that post-colonial theory is adept at understanding particularities. Uh, because it can't distinguish the particularities from the general, it, because it has no theory of the general. In fact, it doesn't properly understand the particularities since it exoticizes them and in my view, reifies them. So in order to understand the particularities, you have to know how the particular contrasts from the general or from the universal. Since they do not understand what it means for capital to universalize, they can't distinguish aspects of the local that are embodiments of the universal and aspects of the local that are embodiments of the particular. They don't know how to tell the difference. So I think it's a failure all around. And this is why close colonial theory relentlessly exoticizes the East. Those things which are entirely generic to capital, as long as it has, they have some local elements that are discernible in them, as long as they have some local signatures of the consciousness and the culture of the country that's being studied, they reify and they exoticize it. So in my view, there's a big difference between appreciating the particular and reifying or exoticizing it. And post-colonial theory has no means of distinguishing that. And uh, the book became kind of kind of controversial, or let's say it's- uh... well, You can imagine, I mean, just look at what I've said right now. Can you imagine <laughs> yeah. how people would respond to this? I mean, there are thousands of careers that are staked on this, this nonsensical theory. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, one of the most famous critics was Spivak, and uh, you also wrote a response. And if I'm not mistaken, it was published uh, as an edited collection by Verso. Yes, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it's a book called "The, the Debate on Postcolonial Theory and the yeah. Spectrum." Yeah. Um, can you briefly say what Spivak's critique of your theory was and what your response was? But I don't know that the more extended version is available online. Well, there's no way to describe it without making her sound foolish, but let me just do it. Um, the essence of her critique, it was a, quite remarkable. And I, I would urge viewers and listeners to check it themselves. There wasn't much content to the critique. It was basically, there were two memorable things in it. And now it's been eight years and I've tried to erase it from my memory because it was so poorly written. But one was how dare Chibber criticize Guha, doesn't he realize that he's an old man? I don't know what to say to that, except that I'm sorry, I, I can't control how old he is. I'm criticizing him because the work is influential. Another element of the critique was, and this was odd, subaltern studies are primary texts and one does not criticize primary texts which I could not even make any sense. I don't know what that means because of course you, you criticize any primary text. If you read Aristotle or Marx, you criticize him. If you, I, I don't know what it means. Um, and then of course the usual stuff, which is Chibber um, doesn't tolerate criticism of Marxism. So then I had to respond and say, well, here's all the things in Marxism that I think actually are flawed and I think are, uh, are uh, open to criticism. And then, you know, Again, kind of awkwardly, I had to say, well, here's the things where I think Marxism is valid. Um, it, was, it was like debating a child. I, I didn't know what to say. The whole tone was one which, in which debate is not tolerated, in which you're supposed to be subservient to your elders, in which you're supposed to know your place. It, I, don't, I wouldn't call it a, a criticism that she wrote. It was more like an angry screed. <laughs> 
Um, I don't know if she knows the difference, frankly. I, I think Spivak is a, well, let me just leave it at that. Thank you, but uh, yeah, but as, as you mentioned, it's been published and it's, um, and it's actually one of the good things is that there is this idea of critique and debates that people critique and you also write a response and people can read and have a judgment for themselves. So thank you. Uh, let us talk a little bit about the book Orientalism and also Edward said, you wrote an article which is uh, called Orientalism and its Afterlives. And um, there's a quote from the article that I'd like to read and I absolutely love this quote. Um, and then you can talk about it a bit. So in the book, in the RK, you write that it's no small irony that Said, a deeply committed humanist, secularist, and cosmopolitan, is now associated with an intellectual trend that traduces those very values. This apparent paradox, I would, I would argue, is in fact not so mysterious. It reflects real weaknesses in Orientalism's basic arguments, weaknesses that are exposed very early by critics from the South but that were brushed aside by the new left in its flight from materialism. And I love that expression, flight from materialism. And I'm guessing one of the critics you're also talking about is Ajaz Ahmed, who criticized Edward Said, and unfortunately it just turned out into a bitter argument between the two. So um, can, can you uh, expand on that quote? What do you mean when you say that he, he, he has become the symbol of all the values that... Um, uh, that, that all the values that I mean, postcolonial theory has kind of become the symbol of all the values that he the, that don't really represent Edward Said himself, and also the flight from materialism. Well, Said himself was a believer in human rights, in certain universal principles of justice and decency. He himself uh, used the concepts of the Enlightenment and of rationality to defend pa the Palestinian cause. Um, and he was a, an admirer of many what aspects of what to, today we call uh, liberal humanism. Well, of course, post-colonial theory quite profoundly rejects all of these things. It rejects liberalism as being a Western imposition on the East. It rejects rationality and reason as being Western concepts as against Eastern forms of thought. It rejects the notion of universal human rights as being an imperialist in imposition because the whole notion of individual rights, again, uh, draws on the concept of the, an individual as an autonom the autonomous reasoning individual, which is something that comes out of Western thought. Easterners, as I show in my book, are supposed to be more collectively oriented, other oriented, governed by mutual obligation rather than a sense of individual rights, et cetera. So, um, and of course, famously, post-colonial theories identified with a reification and an essentialization of the East. That, they deny this, but if, if they didn't, if they hadn't done it, nobody would have noticed that. So of course they do this. Now, all of that, to my mind, goes against the certain deep aspects of Said's stated political commitments and stated political obligations and, and, and um, practice. So there's a vari variance there, which is odd. It occurs, he, why, why then would he become their patron saint? It's because of the particular way in which Orientalism, his book, was written and the way in which Orientalism did two things. One was the book did, in fact, as I show in my article, uh, draw a deep, deep chasm between East and West which is ironic because it was saying that, that the drawing up of, of that chasm is actually essential to Orientalist ideology. And yet the book does it itself. This is something that post-colonial theorists were able to, I think, build upon and internalize because that's what their project was committed to. And the second thing it did was, it was a, he was the first self-styled radical coming out of the global South that said Marx is just another white imperialist. Nobody had done that before. And he made it respectable because he has a great cachet in the 80s and 90s among both scholars of the global south, but also in the West who are anti, who are criticizing empire. Now he gives them the ability to reject Marx, which is what they were all looking for. And in fact, to say that they are more radical than Marx. So typically we associate the rejection of Marx with right-wing criticism. The new left as it's morphing into whatever you wanna call it by the late 90s, absolutely wanted to see itself as still being radical. But it wanted to reject Marx, partly, partly because its own 
its members' ideologies have shifted, but partly also you can't get ahead in American academia if you embrace Marx. That's just a fact. And they were all committed to their academic advancement by then. Said makes it possible to both call yourself a radical and to say Marx is just a dead white guy. It's just an imperialist. And so they embrace it. And uh, this is what catapults him to an absolutely unassailable position in the pantheon of radical intellectuals in the early 2000s. Did I answer your question? Yes, yes. And I think one of the early, um, because when I first started reading Orientalism when I was a student, um, and I also started reading a little bit of critique of the book, and I think a lot of people um, brought up the same critique that it, the book also essentializes the East in building up this dichotomy between East and the West. And um, that was an interesting point you mentioned about the flight from materialism, uh, which I'll ask you uh, uh, a little bit more about later on. Um, in, in the article, uh, so um, let me get this, get, ask you another question. I think you, you do mention that it's a great book, but it's prefigured and, and again, quoting from your book, uh, but the book uh, prefigured and hence encouraged some of the central dogmas of post-colonial studies. And what I like about your critique is that you are, um, you, you, you're um, not really prejudiced, or let's say you're, you, you present a fair argument there. Um, I listened to one of your interviews where you mentioned that you have no problem with post-colonial theory as long as it sticks to the air, to the arenas of culture and literature. But the problem is that they use culture as a main instrument to critique or as a main, let's say, critical instrument to look at imperialism or colonization in general. They completely disregard political or socioeconomic factors. Is that um, a fair judgment? Uh, no, I'm actually, I think post-colonial theory is a disaster, even in cultural studies and in English studies. Um, because even in literary theory in li and in cultural studies, it still tries to present a certain view of the global South, of the culture of the global South, the literature coming out of the global South. And it's just, it's racist. There's no other way to say it. The, the way, the, the, when we say, we use these fancy words, Morteza, like it essentializes the East. It ra it's just a fancy way of saying it's racist. And that's what it is. But, you know, the truth of it is everybody who's coming out of the left recognizes it. But the problem is the left outside of the academy has been destroyed. It doesn't exist inside the academy. If you're in these disciplines and you make these arguments, your career is over because it's run like a mafia. So it, it, everybody on the left knows this. But it's very hard for them to say it without suffering dire consequences for their careers. Um, I, there is no tradition of debate and discussion in post-colonial theory. Spivak's critique of me exemplified that. You either fall into line or you're kicked out. It's not a surprise. It's a tradition that says reason, rationality, evidence, and argument are Western concepts <laughs> and therefore imperialist concepts. So what do you have left? If you can't use reason, rationality, and evidence, all you have left is power. And so you settle debates by beating people up. And that's what's happening. So in my view, it's been an intellectual disaster, top to bottom. Uh, there's an enormous, fruitful tradition of cultural inquiry that pre-exists post-colonial theory. There's a tremendous tradition of understanding the particular and the local coming out of Marxism, coming out of even liberalism. But all of it respects the universal. And it contrasts the particular from the universal. All of it respects the underlying commonality that we have as human beings, even though we, we inhabit different cultures, speak different languages, and have different modes of expression. What post-colonial theory did was it divided up the world into tribes and said no one tribe can ever understand or speak to the other. How can that possibly be a progressive or fruitful line of inquiry or, or social engagement? It can't. Post-colonial theory was at its essence a natural product of the neoliberal era. And as we come out of neoliberalism, this theory will cease to have the hold. It'll never go away because if you give an ac academic license to never look for evidence, never betoken criticism, to never have to change their mind, it's like manna from the gods. So there'll be lots of academics, especially ac academics from the global south, who will adopt it because they'll say, you can never understand my culture. You have to come to me. I'm the native informant. I'm the key and you have to go through me. It's an automatic license to expertise, which every academic from a certain culture is gonna embrace because it helps their career. 
So it'll never go away, but it won't have the hold that it once did. Thank you. And I think yeah, more recently have been more uh, cogent critiques of post-colonial theory, especially the 21st century that we are now. And um, you, uh, you also mentioned that uh, the issues, or let's say the issues that post-colonial theory seeks to address, Marxism already had a response for those issues, as you have also talked about it right now. And I think that's the same thing that uh, Timothy Brennan also mentions, that there were these academics, mainly from Global South, with well-to-do families who sometimes had political connections to their country of origin, but they came to academia as if they were the first people ever to critique colonization. But what was, uh, let me ask it this way, what was a Marxist solution to all these differences uh, before, before post-colonial theory? What was the solution that it put forth? Marxism began in the 20th century by trying to understand the local and the particular. Where is Marxism spreading the fastest in the early 20th century? It's in areas of what we would call the global south, primarily Russia for the Russian revolution, but then of course also China, then soon after that India, now it's also growing in the West, but where were all the really profound theoretical debates occurring? It's in, is Russia a capitalist country, isn't it? How do we understand the peculiarities of the Russian model? Then with Mao, how do we try to understand the Chinese model of capitalism? How is it different from the Western one? How do we understand how classes work in the agrarian sector with a theory that is overwhelmingly about urban manufacture, which is Marx's class theory? How do we understand in Latin America the position of the indigenous as against the peasants, as against the, the urban manufacturers? All of these debates that are so well known in the pantheon of Marxism are about trying to make sense of countries and locales that are profoundly different from the locales that Marx based his theory on. All of these debates are about going from the general to the particular, about understanding the place of the particular, about how they relate to the general laws of capitalism. Now that's in theory. In practice, you cannot do socialist organizing in a country like Iran or a country like India or a country like Russia without being able to understand the particular because people inhabit their cultures locally and regionally. So when Iranian Marxists go into Tehran or they go into the countryside, and they try to organize, they're not going to speak in with the Cockney accent. They're not going to be speaking English. They're not going to be talking about Manchester. They'll be talking about how capitalism affects the reality and the lives of the Iranian worker or the Indian worker. They practice this every day. And you see the theory in the pamphlets that they write, in the, 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 uh, the leaflets that they make. There's a hundred year long history of this. Now, just to come in and say Marxism has never understood the particular shows a level of either ignorance or bad faith that boggles the mind. Uh, you just reminded me of an article that I read some time ago. I don't remember the title, but it was exactly on the same point. The history of those pamphlets being written by laborers uh, or uh, those who uh, work for the unions. Uh, I have to go and dig it up. I don't know where it was. Uh, thank you. And. Um, another question that I have is that these days, as you mentioned earlier, that being critical of postcolonial theory could easily be misunderstood as being a voice of the right wing or extremist, especially these days, but we have um, a lot of critique against Marxism in general. And um, ironically, the, cri cri you know, the critiques are coming from people who have absolutely no idea what Marxism is. Um, we have, you know, the, with the recent events such as Black Lives Matter and also pseudo intellectuals like uh, Jordan Peterson always bashing Marxism or postmodern post Marxism. I have no idea what the hell that is. Um, so being, being critical of, of postcolonial theory is easily misunderstood or let's say misinterpreted as being the voice of the racists or right wingers. Now, my question is that um, you argue for going back to, the, to, 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 to materialism, let's say. And uh, how, should we completely, let's say, dismantle or ignore intersectionality or identity politics in terms of the little progress that they have had in the past uh, few decades in terms of recognizing the rights of minorities, religious, racial, or sexual minorities? 
Well, you're talking about two different things. Intersectionality is a particular intellectual framework and identity politics is a form of political engagement. Those are, one is a way of understanding the world. The other is a way of engaging the world. Those are two different things. We absolutely should not ignore or dismiss identity politics because what identity politics is when it's practiced correctly is a struggle against forms of oppression. And you have to embrace that. Um, again, just to say the same thing, socialists have nothing to be embarrassed about here. The, in, across the 20th century, socialists were at the helm of most all of the movements against oppression, whether it be racial or whether it be gender or any other. So there's a long history of socialists fighting for civil rights and for ethnic autonomy and for national autonomy, et cetera. Most of the key movements, including in the United States, the civil rights movement in the United States was led by people who were socialists of various kinds. Martin Luther King considered himself a socialist. His main lieutenants, A. Philip Randolph and Bear Drustin were union organizers and socialists. The key movements for national autonomy across the world were led by socialists. So there's no, it's an odd question to pose to a Marxist, which is, should socialists or Marxists abandon identity politics? It would be odd since they've been leading the struggle against oppression for a hundred years now. That said, there are different kinds of identity politics. There is the kind that focuses on the poor and the material oppressions that they face and the way in which the various forms of racism and ethnic chauvinism or gender oppression deprive people of basic rights and basic amenities. And then there's an elite version of identity politics, which is really geared towards enhancing and accelerating the upward mobility of elite groupings within oppressed populations. So wealthy blacks or wealthy women or wealthy Latinos. That identity politics, of course you should reject. Any decent person should reject that because that's a kind of class politics. And frankly, that is the overwhelmingly dominant form of identity politics in America today. And it's a ruse that the right wing uses when you, as a leftist, you criticize that identity politics, you say, ah, look, they're class reductionists or look, they're embracing white supremacy. Now the left has, what do you do? You just, you fight that. The reason we're unable to fight that right now is Marxists have no social base. <laughs> they're trapped inside NGOs and the academy. And so the only people they ever talk to is people of the same class as them. This will not go away until there are black and brown leaders coming out of the working class who argue against and who expose the elite black and brown intellectuals who use identity politics as a way of shutting down debate and as a way of enhancing their own careers and enhancing their own political and, and um, professional ambitions. We should keep trying to expose it, but at the end of the day, it's, it'll, it'll be truly exposed when people from the same demographics and groups who the elites claim to be speaking for expose them and criticize them and say that this is this has very little to do with the lives and with the obstacles that we face on an everyday basis um and and i guess in another one of your interviews uh you you, you call it vogue capitalism in a way just capitalizing on these ideas of gender and I think there was uh, the book some time ago, New Liberal Feminism, if I'm not mistaken, written by Elizabeth Prugel. I'm, yeah, I'm well, sure. what, what this is basically, look, what, what race, what's called racial justice in the US today is all about diversifying elite institutions, getting more black professors into Harvard, my, and, and where I teach NYU, hiring more black and brown faculty at NYU, arguing over whether or not there are enough black students or brown students at Yale. Th this is all about, Cre creating more openings in positions of power. Now that what's woke about it is it mistakes the diversity at the, at the top for social justice for the overwhelming majority who are at the bottom. It has nothing to do with justice. It's using justice to amplify the opportunities being made available to the top layer of these particular groups. As a last question, which is somehow related to what you just said, uh... Why is it that critique in general has become so much detached from, from, from the public and it has no praxis anymore? 
because where it's supposed it is where it was supposed to have its practice and as you mentioned there was a long history of marxist with pamphlets you know going among people talking to people but nowadays it has all been retreated into academia and they speak a very very difficult convoluted language that is only understood if you're if you've done a phd or if you have read their books but uh, and, and there's all these ideas of diversity as you have right to mention it's all about the elite at the top so why what, what happened to critical theory uh it was handed over to professors and they destroyed it <laughs> that's all that happened um for a hundred years marxism was mainly developed by intellectuals who were not in universities and because of that the theory had to make sense because they were trying to use it in their political practice so there was if they didn't try to make sense of the world the world would crush them in the academy you can say any damn thing you want nobody cares so, and in the academy, especially in the social sciences and the humanities, since there's actually very little progress. In natural sciences, it's easier to make progress because you have a world and you're doing experiments and there you can be, those experiments can tell you whether you've understood the causal structure of the world or not. You can repeat the experiment, you can validate it. You can't really do that very much in the, what's called the moral sciences, unless you're using statistical data sets and things like that. But in a historical work and anthropological work, you pretty much have to take somebody's word for it as to whether they're right or wrong. So um, consensus plays a very large role in the, in these fields, and which encourages a kind of group thinking. It encourages docility and not ruffling feathers because your fate is in the hands of other academics, and you get tenure and you get promotion based on whether or not they find your work agreeable or not. And so that means you're your inclination to question orthodoxy will be reduced because questioning orthodoxy means questioning the work of the people who are going to be judging your career chances. So a career advancement requires docility and that's what academia produces. Because there's very little actual advance, how do you try to give the impression that you've come up with a new idea? Well, you use new words or you use very convoluted language. So it looks like you're expressing something really, really complicated. So complicated, complicated expressions become come to replace a understanding a complicated process. Truly great work, Noam Chomsky likes to say this. He says, truly great minds take complicated processes and make them simple. Simple minds take simple processes and make them uh, complicated. <laughs> so that's where we are. Well, once you take intellectual production that is supposedly radical and transformative, and you put it in the hands of people who have no interest and no ability to actually change the world. Those radical ideas will become domesticated and used for the purposes of the people who have those ideas. That's intellectuals who are in the academy. So they're using them for their professional advancement. It's weird to have to say this because it's just so obvious. It, it should be a truism that ideas develop depending on the context in which they're being promoted. If you put ideas like Marxism in a professional environment, Marxism will become domesticated to the interests of the professional class. If you put it in the hands of trade unionists, peasant revolutionaries, it will be used to enhance the interests of trade unionists and peasant revolutionaries. What happened is by 1980, the trade unionists, the peasant revolutionaries, the political parties were all either destroyed or domesticated. So the only place where it could have to go was the university and it died. Do you see any future for that to to come out of that university cocoon? I know it's a hypothetical question. Yeah. Uh, well, look, uh, Sartre said this, and I think he was absolutely right. As long as capitalism is around, Marxism will be around, because there is no other theory that actually is capable of understanding capitalism. So as long as it's around, Marxism will be around. It will never ever again have the place in the academy that it did in the seventies and eighties. That was a or 60s and 70s, a very unusual circumstance. And it will never ever again find a happy or friendly place in the academy. Because now they, what, what the 1990s did was that they made it possible to call yourself a radical and get all the cachet and all the respect that comes with being a radical while being completely devoted to neoliberalism and capitalism. But so for the foreseeable future, radicalism in the university in the university will be profoundly 
anti-Marxist, and in my view, quite reactionary. Universities will never be a place like they were in the 70s where Marxism was actually flourishing. But that's fine. Uh, it belongs out in the street where it always was, in the, um, among the workers and the trade unionists. There, yes, it absolutely, it will not only has a chance, it has to grow because we are in the midst of one of the most profoundly inhuman periods of capitalist history where people are being ground into dust as the neoliberal era no longer generates growth, no longer generates wages, and politics is becoming everywhere a kind of tribal politics of fighting ethnicities, fighting identities, of uh, racial warfare, because that's what's being promoted by the intellectuals and by the ruling classes. There's nowhere else to go for the left other than back to Marxism. Now, the question is, will it happen in time? Because we're up against the clock, because climate change is destroying human civilization. Will it happen in time? That I can't say. I do know, though, that if humanity has a future, it's with a return to the socialist tradition. And that's why I'm being so uh, blunt with you in the, in the answers that I'm giving. I'm not giving you the typical answers professors give because it's been 40 years of this nonsense and we have to come out of it. Otherwise, there's no hope for us. Thank you. And uh, I've been watching actually your, uh, I've been following your work since 2014, I guess, when I came to know you. And I can tell you have become more, I mean, more blunt with your criticism of post-colonial theory or this trend of uh, intellectual academia. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I absolutely enjoyed this conversation. My pleasure, Martisa. Thank you. And thank you for doing this work.